Hi, in previous series we took a look at DC circuit fundamentals and that was quite a few videos and we covered lots of stuff including inductors and capacitors and a transient circuit analysis as well which you a lot of people might have thought was actual AC circuit theory but it's not, it's DC transient circuit theory because as we're going to look at today we're going to do an akadaka and we've got to look at alternating current basics. So now we have to move on to AC circuit theory and that includes AC signal generation, the importance of sinusoidal waveforms as we'll see in this video and then on to AC circuit theory which can actually be pretty much identical to DC circuit theory, the AC Ohm's law as we'll look at in future videos but it can also be surprisingly different in many ways. So let's have a look at alternating current basics. So what is alternating current compared to DC or direct current? Well it's obvious it alternates polarity. If we've got our waveform like this, DC would just be like this is zero volts, this is one volt or we've got current here. So let's say zero amps, one amp up here, DC direct current would be just a straight line like that. It'd just be one amp. But alternating current it changes direction. It's positive up here, in this case positive 1 amp, and then it goes negative 1 amps like this. It physically changes direction in the wire like that. The current, the electron flow, actually changes direction. And that's pretty much the definition of AC or alternating current, which is confusing because you can go AC voltage and it's like or alternating current voltage, that doesn't make sense, but that's the terminology, AC voltage. You'll find lots of stuff like that in engineering. But, and that's pretty much the definition of AC, is it really has to change polarity like this. If you've just got DC up here, which might have some ripple on it like this, that might look like alternating current but it's still direct current with ripple and uh, yeah flame wars in the comments down below the difference between <laughs> is this actually AC and is it DC. Eh, anyway we'll get into the details of this but suffice it to say for this video we're talking about alternating current that's phys current physically changing direction. And this is super important theory because or most of our power generation and our telecommunications, RF signal transmission, this all happens in the AC domain. And this all happens with the sinusoidal wave like this. And there's actually something very special about the sinusoidal wave, as we'll go through in a minute. Now, the sinusoidal wave shape like this comes about naturally in rotating magnetic fields like you get in generators, which is used for most of our power generation, be it uh, wind turbine generators, hydro power generators, steam power generators, which are also nuclear. Nuclear energy just heats up steam, basically, which then drives a, a, a turbine which uh, drives a generator like this and that generates always a sinusoidal output. Actually you want as close to a perfect sinusoidal output like this as possible on a generator for reasons where, that we're going to get into. So we're going to look at how a basic generator here works and this brings us back to a formula you've seen before in even DC fundamentals when we talked about inductors. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Uh, the induced voltage in volts is uh, negative, uh, the chain, which is Lenz's law, won't go into details, watch previous videos, the change in the magnetic flux in Weber's per second. So basically defy dt here just means the change of magnetic flux over time in Weber's per second and that's it. And then I won't derive how we actually get down to here but basically this formula here you should uh, pretty much remember along with uh, Faraday's law this is the formula for the induced voltage in a conductor in a magnetic field and it's equal to the flux density in Tesla's B multiplied by the length of the conductor at 90 degrees to the magnetic field in meters multiplied by the velocity of the conductor through the magnetic field in meters per second. Simple. And of course we've got all that stuff inside a generator like this. So let's have a look. We've got a north pole of a magnet, south pole of a magnet like this. We've got a shaft in there like that which contains a core and that red 
uh, part around there is just a single turn coil. Of course, it can be multiple turns. You wouldn't have a single turn coil in there. Not very efficient, but we'll run with a single turn for today. And the wires come out here like this. Now, I won't get into details of how the power actually uh, gets out of there. I won't go into like the mechanical slip rings and everything like that. Doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> Basically, voltage current comes out of the coil like this as it rotates in a magnetic field. And if we have a look down here, this is like a side cross section of this 3D model up here. Please excuse the crudity of model, didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Um, at north and south pole here, we've got a uniform magnetic field through here. Let's just assume that it's a uniform magnetic field. And then we've got our coil here and here like this, and the coil will rotate through the magnetic field like that and go around and around and around, and this will actually produce a sinusoidal wave shape. How does it do that? Basic trigonometry. You learn in uh, school if we uh, take like the vertical axes like this, as the, the angle of the coil like this is theta here, and theta is the angle, and of course, you know your basic trig trigonometry, it's just sine theta is the angle through that field. So as it goes through, it actually naturally develops, assuming you've got a uniform magnetic field and everything's hunky-dory, you get a sinusoidal wave shape out like that. And when the coil is right in, in the horizontal position like this, this is the actual maximum uh, velocity through the magnetic field like this. It's at its highest velocity at this point. So at 90 degrees like that, this is when you'll generate your peak voltage here and here like this, depending on which orientation it is, depends on which, whether it's positive or negative peak. But when it's up right at 90 degrees like this, it's not, there's basically no movement through the magnetic field. The velocity drops to zero because it's not going through the magnetic field. The magnetic field's going in this direction. It's basically, it, it, it reaches a point where it's, it's zero. So here, 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 it's basically generating nothing when the coil is vertical like that. Pretty simple, but that's your basically ba basic formula for induced voltage in a magnetic field. So basically our maximum voltage here, our peak voltage we're gonna get is B times L times V. So the instantaneous voltage here, so let's, well this could be E, voltage here, the instantaneous voltage at any point in time here equals E max, which is the maximum, assuming it's like one up there, multiplied by sine theta, the angle of the coil in the magnetic field. So therefore you end up with that sinusoidal shape, simple. So in basic maths, when you're talking about sinusoidal waves and cosine and, and tangents and everything else, you might talk in terms of degrees like this. So zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. And in electronics, we do uh, talk about, in, in engineering, we talk about uh, degrees in terms of phase difference. So if you have two waveforms and they shift like this, we generally talk in terms of uh, degrees. But what's more helpful to use when it comes to talking about AC stuff is to talk in what's called angular frequency. So we use W to represent that, which is actually uh, omega in the Greek alphabet. It's not just the ohm symbol, it's also the little W thingy. Anyway, Greek alphabet rubbish. Anyway, equals two pi F. So we talk about this in terms of pi. So 90 degrees is actually pi on two, 180 degrees is just pi, and 270 degrees is three pi on two, or however you want to represent that, and 2 pi is 360 degrees, i.e. a full cycle of an AC waveform like this. Because one thing I actually didn't point out before is like another definition of AC or something that it, it needs to include this to be uh, like deemed to be AC. And this is what differentiates it from uh, the transient analysis in DC. You just have a single transient like this. AC actually has to have a frequency. It's gotta have a period and it's gotta uh, basically repeat that for infinity or X amount of time to really be considered AC in quote marks. So yeah, it's it, it's gotta be more than just, if it's one cycle, hmm, if a tree falls in a forest, do you hear it? And if you've only got one cycle, is it still AC? Comment down below. Anyway, the angular frequency is two pi F and you'll find this two pi 
everywhere in electronics and 2 pi f is very important and in this case we're talking about angular frequency like this instead of degrees. Anyway, this is in units of radians per second. So and we can do, once again, the instantaneous voltage E equals E max times C, uh, sine omega T like this. And then if you run it through the wash, T equals one on F and with T being your time period like this. And well, that's <laughs> one of the most fundamental equations in all of electronics, how to convert time into frequency. It's just inverse. And this, by the way, is why your confuser here almost certainly has a degrees and radians and gradients button. Gradients, eh, some weird French thing that surveyors might still use. I don't know. Degrees and radians mode. Your calculator's got it. Guarantee it. That's what it's for. So that's what it's for on your calculator. Degrees, radians, or gradients, which is like 400 gradients for one, uh, one time period, one T, one turn of your generator is 400 gradients. Meh. Anyway, radians, beauty. So if we do pi on our calculator in radians mode like this and get the sign of that, it's zero because it's in the middle of the waveform that we saw there. But if we do pi divided by two, equals, and then sine, ah, uh, it's one, because that's when our waveform peaks right up there. Beauty. And then three times pi divided by two equals sine minus one. Ha, oh, the maths works. And once again, with all this stuff, you can really go down the rabbit hole to the physics side of things and, and advanced mathematics of it and everything, and it's like, nah. But anyway, let's get on to the importance of the sine wave and more circuit theory related stuff, because I know that like motors and generators might be boring, but it's important that you know where that sinusoidal wave shape can come from physically, and it does in the real world. <laughs> you know, probably a majority of the power that comes out of your PowerPoint was generated with, a gen with an AC generator like this. So I mentioned before specific benefits of sinusoidal AC. So let's take a look at them. And this basically applies to sinusoidal shape ACs because it's the ideal AC waveform. Sure, you can get square waves, which are AC, and you can get triangular waves. You can get all sorts of, you know, pulse width modulator waveforms, which can be AC and all sorts of stuff. But in particular, sinusoidal ones have specific benefits. Let's take a look at them. It's easy to physically produce high powers as we looked at those generators. This is how the vast majority probably of the power that you're using is generated uh, using perfect sinusoidal AC from a generator. Sure, of course, these days solar is a big thing and it generates DC, but um, you know, still the majority is probably going to be coming from some sort of AC generator, be it wind, hydro, coal, nuclear, whatever it is. And because the sinusoidal waveform is only one frequency, and I'll talk about that, more about that in a minute, it's easy to efficiently transform and isolate these voltages using transformers. So you go from like 500,000 uh, volts, 500 kilovolts, or even 700 kilovolts, I think these days, AC transmission lines, those huge ones, they're easy to step down, and you can do that very efficiently using AC, sinusoidal AC, in transformers. They're incredibly efficient and you can use those at the signal level as well if you're designing uh, circuits. Audio and other telecommunications type stuff can be isolated using transformers. Easy peasy because a transformer is just a coil of wire and like a piece of ferrite. It's really simple stuff and it's what's used for all basically all RF and communications technology is basically you can't just put DC on an antenna and have it transmit something. It's got to oscillate. And if it oscillates using a sine wave, that is one pure frequency because don't want to go into it in this video, but you've probably heard me mention uh, Fourier before. And Fourier's theorem, or Fourier transforms, as you've heard about, FFTs in basically oscilloscopes. This is how like a spectrum analyzer works in your oscilloscope, Fourier transforms. Fourier theorem basically says that any wave shape at all is made up of sine waves. So if you've got a square wave like this, it's actually made up of sine waves at lots of different frequencies. So when you plot a frequency spectrum instead of time, oh, that's F, 
that's supposed to be F there, trust me. Frequency like this, if you've got a sine wave, it's just one line on your spectrum analyzer. Say that's one kilohertz or something like that. And then you might have another line here at harmonic multiples of that, things like that. But any waveform, doesn't matter what it is, sine, square, triangle, wiggly, piggly, your uh, heart, uh, you know, cardiac waveform or whatever, it can be made up, as long as it's periodic, can be made up of sine waves. And if you've only got one sine wave, then you can actually transmit exactly on that frequency. There's no other harmonics either side of it, so you can fit a lot more different bits of information in the same bandwidth using different frequencies. And that comes down here, they can be sharply filtered as well. So that allows all sorts of RF and, uh, you know, telecommunications magic to actually happen. All done with sine waves. And as we've seen, sine waves are naturally produced in uh, generators, but they're also produced in oscillator circuits as well. Weanbridge oscillators, Colpix oscillators, uh, you know, phase shift oscillators or whatever. And also when you filter stuff, what comes out of it, if you've got a simple RC filter and you feed a square wave into it, it could be LC, RC, it could be an active filter, whatever it is, feed into a filter, what comes out? Hopefully, a perfect sine wave. The better the filter, the more perfect a sine wave comes out. And this is a really interesting point. The sinusoidal wave shape is the only wave shape that is not distorted by when it passes through capacitors and inductors because well that's what magically comes out so if you feed in a sine wave you're going to get a sine wave out of a filter even though the filter is made up of inductors and capacitors and whoop that's an inductor there little hairy resistor is an inductor who knew that anyway you feed that in and it's not you can filter them out but the actual wave shape is not distorted by those components whereas if you looked in the previous videos of DC fundamentals where we looked at transient circuits in capacitors and inductors yeah they it actually distorts them and yes I know if you feed a square wave through a series capacitor like that with no load then you're going to get a square wave on the output except that if this is DC here the DC will now be, well, it, uh, DC will be removed because it's an AC coupling capacitor. It removes all the DC. But anyway, once you start trying to drive that into a load and actually pass in like a large current through that, yeah, you're going to come a gutsa. Also, sinusoidal AC is great for motor drives and things like that. You can get multi three phase or multi phase motor drives and stuff like that. Really efficient stuff. Anyway, but some of the problems with AC, of course, well, you can't store it, of course, like you can in uh, batteries. It just sits as electrochemistry inside a battery and it's not actually not that easy to measure as we'll look at in a minute you basically have to like rectify it in order to measure the value of it unless you do it there's other ways you can do it but anyway it's, it's actually not as easy to measure as dc and basically ac is not a thing and even can be a problem for like m much of the electronics out there all your digital stuff and all the other things like your dc power supply you want a rock solid 3.3 volts or 5 volt supply if as we saw before like it has some ripple on you know if it's got some ripple on there if you've got some 50 hertz ripple from your uh, transformer power supply or something like that that can ruin your day you don't want that you want to get rid of AC from any sort you know to much of modern electronics but it's useful for a whole range of stuff so there's tons of benefits to sinusoidal AC and that's why it's uh, pretty much the duck's guts in his sort of like high power and RF stuff and things like that. You just can't do the same sort of stuff you can with DC, at least not easily. And yes, you can actually uh, transmit power using DC high voltage transmission. I've actually done a video, I'll link it in down below and up here. It's very interesting about high voltage DC transmission. It's over on my EEV Vlog 2 channel, so check that out. But basically, yes, you can use DC to like transfer large amounts of power over transmission lines and stuff like that. But then ultimately, you've got to like chop it up and do some DC stuff to uh, DC to AC conversion to actually uh, convert it and then basically convert it back to DC. So you're never going to escape. Escape AC and all of your DC to DC converters or your switch mode power supplies and things like that you're so used to using in modern electronics well it's DC it's chopped up it becomes AC basically and that's what you're feeding through the transformer and this brings us to some really important terminology you use all the time in electronics and it can be used for both voltage and current. So we're just going to use voltage here. So we've got our original waveform like this doesn't have to be sinusoidal, we'll get into that. So we've basically got four different ways to define 
the voltage of this waveform. As I said, it's actually not that easy to measure, let alone be able to communicate what the actual value is to somebody else. So what we've got is four different ones. We've got peak, peak to peak, average and RMS or what's called root mean squared. So a peak, the voltage peak here is from zero or a reference point, doesn't necessarily have to be zero, but it's defined as the uh, reference point of the waveform. And because it's AC, it'll go negative as well. So the peak value is simply the value where it reaches absolute maximum in one direction like that relative to the reference. In this case, it's one volt. So you might say one volt peak, and it'll be usually represented by either PK or just P. If you just see P on its own, you know that's peak. But the peak to peak voltage, as it's called, is the value from the negative excursion bottom down here to the positive excursion up here like that. That is your peak to peak voltage. And if you've got a symmetrical waveform, the peak to peak voltage is going to be twice the peak voltage, obviously. Now, one of the downsides about peak and peak to peak voltages, while they're very commonly used, they don't actually tell you anything, any information at all about the way the actual waveform shape. It doesn't actually care. This could be a perfect sine wave, could be a triangle wave, a square wave, doesn't matter what this waveform is. If it goes to plus one up here and minus one down to here, it, it doesn't matter. It could have a tiny little spike like this, tiny little spike down here. It could be like a, you know, that could be a very poor power factor as we've looked at, wave, mains waveform or something. The peak to peak, it doesn't matter what the waveform is. The peak to peak is just the actual instantaneous peak value like that. But average and RMS, they're different. They actually take into account the actual waveform itself. Now the average value is defined as this, and there's several different ways to sort of explain it, but this is the way I'll do it. It's the total area under the waveform divided by the period of the waveform. So the total area under the waveform that means all this area under here like this, like to the axes, you've got to have it like to a reference axis. So all the area under there, but we've also got all this area under here. And this one's positive and this one's negative. And because it's a perfect sinusoidal waveform or it could be a perfect square wave, uh, for example, it doesn't actually matter if the area above the axis here is equal to the area below the axis here, and they're both the same amplitude like this, the average value will actually come out at zero. So if you feed an AC voltage, a perfect AC voltage with no DC offset, into your DC multimeter, which reads average value, it'll read zero. And also for multimeters that aren't true RMS multimeters, that'll have true RMS written on them usually, they will actually be what's called an average responding multimeter for AC. So what that means is that it assumes that the waveform you're measuring in AC voltage mode or AC current mode on your multimeter is a perfect sine wave. If it's not a perfect sine wave, it's gonna give you an error. It's not gonna be accurate because the multimeter has only been calibrated to assume a perfect sine wave. To give you another example from digital electronics you might be uh, familiar with, if you've got a V here, so that, that goes up to one volt there, this is time, and if you've got a pulse width modulated square wave that is you know, like this, let's say that this is 10% of the time, this and it's zero, 90% of the time like this, what is the average value going to be? Well, our axis is zero volts down here like this. Everything's above the axis. It's not actually an AC waveform. It doesn't go negative, but this can actually apply to, it doesn't matter where the reference point is. Our reference point in this case is zero, okay? The total area under the waveform, so the period from here to here It'll be one volt for 10% of the time multiplied by nine zero volts for 95% of the time. So therefore, it'll actually equal one-tenth of that or 0.1 volts will be your average value over the period of one waveform. So let's analyze a half wave rectified sine wave and you'll be familiar with this if you've done made any do-it-yourself basic power supply from a transformer. So this is our AC uh, transformer. 
just got a single diode in there, um, it's just driving a load, there's no filter capacitor because that smooths it out and ruins your day. So we've got a waveform that looks like this. It's uh, Here's our total period here from 0 to 2 pi or 0 to 360 uh, degrees and it's, as its name suggests, is a half wave rectifier. It only rectifies the positive half. The other half of the waveform down here, when it goes negative, the diode is uh, reverse biased, so it doesn't conduct at all, so you just get zero. So you get this half wave rectified waveform. Now, we'll analyze this waveform using our formula here, and uh, there's several different ways to look at it, but because it's a sine wave, what I'm gonna do is like, this half of the sine wave from here is identical to this half here. So what I'm going to do is just split it into quadrants like this. So just assume that there's like four different areas that we're calculating here for our one waveform from 0 to 2 pi. So it's the area of A here plus the area of B plus the area of C plus the area of D. You remember it's the total area um, under the waveform divided by the period of the waveform, which is 2 pi. So area A plus B plus C plus D divided by 2 pi. Now, we'll just normalize the area to 1. We'll just call it 1, because we're not talking about any actual absolute value here. So we'll just normalize it to say that area A is 1. Well, area B is identical to area A, obviously. It's a perfect sine wave. So 1 plus 1, and then area C and D are, of course, 0. There's nothing there. So it's 1 plus 1 plus 0 plus 0, or 2 divided by 2 pi, is equal to 0.318. Not 0.318 volts. 0.318 is the factor that you then multiply by your peak value up here. But that is just a factor that you multiply by the peak value up here to give you your actual average voltage for a half-wave rectified waveform. And that's a common number. You'll actually see that uh, a lot, and especially when it's to do with like half-wave stuff. If you see that number, you go, oh yeah, that's half-wave. And we'll now look at a full-wave bridge rectifier. I haven't bothered to draw it, but basically, um, <laughs> familiar with the four, I'll put up the circuit here. Here it is. Now, uh, this will give us a waveform that then looks now like this. So we'll get two humps because it does the positive and the negative cycle as well. But because that's now identical and we've doubled our frequency, say it's 50 hertz here in Australia, not any of that 60 hertz Yankee rubbish, if it's 50 hertz, then it actually becomes 100 hertz now because the waveform is repeated. So our period is not 2 pi anymore, it's just pi, like this. So it's 1 plus 1, area of A plus area of B, divided by pi, which is 0.636. Oh, wait, wait. No, that's... Isn't that meant to be 637? Here, yeah. Sagan. I... 637. Yeah. Why, why would it be 637? Because when you go into the calculator here, if you go 2 divided by pi... Equals. Equals 0 0.6366. So you reckon... Round it up to 0 0.637. 7. Seven. Well, I'm going to say that it's 636 because that's kind of like symmetrical. And, <laughs> and it's right. double 0.318 that I rounded before. So I'm sticking with 636. You reckon 637? I like, I'm the type of person who likes symmetrical and all, but yep. 637. Okay, leave it in the comments down below. Thanks, Egan. Yeah. Now, the thing about peak peak to peak and average voltages is that they're abs and currents is they're useless for measuring power you'll get the wrong value in fact you'll get zero because uh, let's just assume that this is a current waveform okay and you've got it dissipating power into a resistor the, there's going to be power dissipated in the resistor on the positive half like this there's going to be power dissipated in the resistor on the negative part of this because power doesn't care whether the voltage is positive or negative it's just the power dissipated in the resistor or the load then well you but if you measure the average current the average current is going to be zero and zero times at p is i squared r zero squared times r is zero so you've got zero power dissipation uh-uh Go try it. Put an AC waveform into a resistor, you're going to dissipate power. So it doesn't work. In this particular case, we have to use RMS. So RMS stands for, it's right in the name, the root mean squared. Where does the squared bit come from? Well, 
power equals I squared R. There's a squared factor in there. And the, when you square that, that is the mean squared. So if we have a look at the waveform over here for current, we've got our regular AC current waveform, we'll call that IAC here. Then if we square that current, we square it like take every single point on this waveform and square it, the number, any negative numbers, they're going to go positive like this. So it's going to be squared. So it's going to be much larger like this and it's all going to be shifted up on the positive half of the uh, reference axes like this. So we'll call that I squared AC. So that's where our squared factor comes from. So what you do is you actually work backwards. You take the square first, then you take the mean, and then you take the root, the square root. So we've done our squared business. Let's now take the mean. We've looked at the mean before. The mean is the average. Okay, it's just another word for average. The mean, the, the average, is smack in the middle like that because it's a perfect sinusoidal waveform. Squaring it doesn't change the wave shape. It simply shifts it up and changes the amplitude like this. So we'll call that I squared AC average like that. That's our average value. So we've done our squaring business. We've done our mean or average business. Now we need to take the square root of that average value. But what is that average value? Well, it's pretty easy as we looked at before. This is the peak to peak value. Uh, well, it's the peak to peak value of the waveform. It's now the peak value of the waveform. I squared AC is also I squared peak. It's the peak value of the waveform. And the mean value is going to be the peak divided by two. It's smack in the middle. Simple. So this is I squared max, as we'll call it over here. Now, let's actually go through and derive the actual answer for our RMS. And you might be familiar, 0.707, we're getting there. Now, the DC power must equal the AC power, because that's the, basically the definition of RMS, is that uh, it's the equivalent heating in a resistor for uh, the same the, for the equivalent value of DC. So that's what the RMS value actually is. So how we derive this is, well, the power in DC is I squared R. We learned that back at day one. And the power AC here is actually the average value here. Now that we've squared it, it's no longer zero. It's right up there. It's going to be the average value times the, times the resistance in the load. So it, of course, that average value is going to be half of the peak value I max. So th th you could put average in there if you want, like AC average in there if you want, but we'll put half I squared R max. Now, because we've got R on both sides of the equations, we can actually take that out and IDC is equal to the square root because we had square here, so we have to bring it over. And, and now it becomes square root half times that I squared max. And then you can just rearrange that again to be I max on the square root of two. And well, if you say I max is one, then it's 0.707. That's your answer. But the this is the this is the formula for RMS. Value is 0.707 times the maximum current there. So anytime you see 0.707 in electronics, you know you're talking about one on square root of two. And it's basically RMS. And this also applies to voltage as well. So VRMS, the RMS voltage is equal to 0.707 times V max, which is actually V peak to peak. So the equation that you have to remember is volts RMS equals volts peak divided by the square root of two. Or you can remember the uh, 0.707 if you want, but square root of two will give you a more precise answer. So, uh, and that, if you just rearrange that formula, V peak, uh, peak voltage equals the RMS voltage times the square root of two. Easy. And there's other formulas which derive, you know, you can go directly from volts RMS to peak to peak or peak to peak to RMS or whatever. You know, there's various combinations of these. But if you just remember, uh, well, if you remember one of them, you can derive the other and then you can derive the peak to peak from the peak, etc, etc.
Now, we've only looked at ideal sinusoidal waveforms, but what if you've got, I don't know, a sawtooth waveform like this, or you've got like a, a high crest factor, we might go into that, um, a waveform like, you know, current waveform like this. How do you get that? Well, we start looking at integrals, and this is where you get a little bit more advanced uh, calculus, which we don't really want to go into here. So the average value, 1 on t, the integral from 0 to t, and then the function of that, and you, uh, we won't go into the details. You can do this yourself, but it's basically um, an integral is just the area under the curve. And I've done a practical video, I believe, showing this somewhere. I'll try and link it in on, a, on an oscilloscope. Um, the integral is just the area under the curve. So it's exactly what we did before, but you can actually do the average uh, derive, you can derive the average formula we did before using integrals and stuff. But anyway, it's that, and the RMS version of it is simply the square root with the squared in there. It's exactly the, the, uh, the squared factor the mean uh, factor, and then the square root in there. So anyway, we won't go into details. It's basically just getting the area under the curve. So you just have to get this area under the curve here, and you can do that using graphical methods. If it's just like a sawtooth waveform or something like that, or even uh, you know a pulse current uh, waveform like that, like a poor like power factor on a DC to DC converter, you'll get a waveform like that. I've shown that in previous videos. You can do these actually using uh, graphical methods, or you can do it using uh, differential calculus. Now the absolute last thing we're going to look at, I swear, <laughs> for this video anyway, uh, just to round this off, is what's called crest factor. And this is important for uh, RMS, true RMS uh, measurement you might get on your multimeter, for example. This is also known as peak factor as well. And the crest factor or peak factor is V peak on V RMS. So if we've got our waveform here, obviously we've got our peak value up like this, uh, easy, and our RMS value is going to be 0.707 times uh, the peak there that we've seen. And that gives a crest factor of 0.414. Beauty! No worries. <laughs> but if you've got a horrible waveform like this, like uh, the sine wave is like this, but you've seen this in videos where you might have a, uh, a non-power factor corrected uh, mains power supply, for example, current peaks could be up like this. And if you're trying to measure, say, the, with your multimeter, using your true RMS converter in your multimeter, of this waveform like this, if it has a too high, uh, too high a crest factor like this, your true RMS converter won't be able to handle it and you often find uh, the maximum crest factor value in the data sheet for your meter or your true RMS converter chip or measurement system, whatever it is. So there's a maximum, you know, they can't tolerate an infinitely small pulse like this. There's going to be a point where they come a gutsa and just go, I'm going to give, you know, I'm not going to give an accurate value. I'm going to read low. So you can see that the, in this particular case, the, the peak value might be absolutely identical. Say it's one between the two of them, but because it's much shorter like this, the RMS value, of course, is going to be much lower. It's not going to be 0.707 anymore because it's no longer a perfect sine wave. So it could be, could be you know, 0.2 or something volts or something like that. So it's going to be one divided by by 0.2, for example, it's going to be a crest factor of 5, and that, that starts getting up there towards where, you know, your true RMS uh, converter multimeter, because there's different methods for RMS conversion, which we won't go into. Maybe I've done that in another video. Don't know. I've done so many videos. And yet, yeah, that's getting, you know, that's getting pretty high. So once this gets narrow and narrow and narrow, or the, you know, the ratio, it doesn't, like, the waveform can be different. It can be any type of waveform, but the crest factor, V peak on VRMS, if that's too high, then yeah, it screws up your RMS calculations. And you need basically you know, better, faster sampling hardware for your RMS uh, converter chip to actually measure it. Or you might have to go to some method that there's RMS uh, converter chips that actually measure the heating in the resistor. So they don't actually you know, do it sampling wise, they actually like physically measure how much power is dissipated in the resistor. That's old school, 1960s, 70s stuff. So I hope you found that introduction to AC useful. I know it's very long and there's lots of stuff to cover. I could have broken it up maybe into smaller videos, but there's a lot more to come. We haven't even gotten into other stuff like you know, transformers and circuit theory and all sorts of other stuff and AC Ohm's law and all the rest of it. But yeah, you know, complex numbers and things start coming next, but this will all be in part of the AC circuit theories, a circuit theory series. There you go. If you liked it, give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.
Thank <laughs> you.